Welcome back to another episode of Day Zero Lessons, where we talk to some of the most iconic founders who have built groundbreaking companies. And today we have an awesome founder who I've actually been a massive fan of for a couple of years, and we just got connected a couple of weeks ago. So really excited to have you, Paul. Uh, Paul English is the co-founder of Kayak, which is the travel price comparison website, uh, which had nearly uh, just over a $2 billion outcome amongst many other companies, which we'll dive into. So, Paul, we always love having amazing entrepreneurs on the show. So uh, thanks so much for joining us today. It's great to talk with you, Ollie. Hopefully we'll say some things that are outrageous, a little controversial, and have some fun. Yeah, let's do it. Well, hey, I'd love to find out more about you. Um, where did the journey all begin? Where does your entrepreneurial flair bug come from? Let's start with that. Yeah, so neither parent was an entrepreneur. I grew up in a family of nine, so I have the seven kids, so three brothers, three sisters, and um, I grew up in Boston. We lived in a very small house, like a three-bedroom house with nine people, but I had a great childhood. I have an older, I'm number six of the seven, and I, my oldest brother is also an engineer, and <clears throat> he started up his career doing video game development, and I ended up doing sound effects programming for him as a musician, and I think... When he left the corporate world at the age of like 25 and started his own company at age 25, I thought this is very cool. And I went to his office and it's really kind of a crappy office, but just seeing that he ran everything himself was very fun for me. And that's probably the first thing made me think like, yeah, I want to do that someday too. You saw your first company right in your early 20s. What was the idea? Well, I actually, I started my very first company as a teenager. I built a video game. <laughs> One of those. Cupid. And yeah. I licensed it to a, a company in the US. They ended up going bankrupt soon after I licensed it. And then I got very busy with uh, music and other things. And I never ended up relicensing my game to another company, which I probably should have done. Uh, after I worked full time while going to college, I went to school at night and worked for a number of different companies, the Air Force, medical device company, accounting company, operations research at a computer company. And then after I graduated, I worked for one um, document management company, about five or six years, started as an engineer, ended up running engineering, the last year marketing. And then since then, it's just been a string of startups. So I've done six startups. I have six sales. I'm six for six. Very proud of that. And now I'm running a venture studio. How do you think about starting ideas? Do you just kind of come up with an idea and just launch it? Or do you talk to people? What's your whole process? So I probably come up with an idea for a new company about once a week, if not more than that. And the litmus test to me that tells you whether something's worth pursuing is you start pitching the idea to people you really value. And if someone you really value says, that's a good idea, I want to help you. And they want they start putting in hours to work with you on the idea, like before there's any compensation discussed, and they work on it like for free, just for equity or whatever. That's sort of the first litmus test. Mm -hmm. And then you do some customer research. And the biggest thing on customer research isn't really on what you're building, it's on what the problem is you're trying to solve. I think most tech founders, most tech companies fail, and they fail for one of two reasons. Either there's a founder implosion, sort of toxic culture. People leave because they hate their boss, which unfortunately happens a lot. Or the second thing is they build pretty good tech, but for a problem that no one really cares about. And there's just not enough vetting of the problem or some people care about, but the founders might find like one or two, a small number of customers say, oh my God, I can't wait for that solution. But they haven't done enough research to see how big a problem is this. So it's a little bit, problem identification first, and then you start building and you just show revisions to customers. And like most founders, probably the first version of my products for all such companies were terrible, but I do like talking to customers. I'm probably a little introverted by nature, but I think learning how to be successful in tech, I've had to learn how to be a little bit extroverted. So I, like at Kayak, I used to accost people in airports I would buy a cheap flight, the cheapest flight I could buy, like say Boston and New York shuttle, just to get through security. And then I'd sit at a gate and just walk up to people and say, hey, I'm a programmer. I'm running, the, I have this travel app. Can I show it to you? And show it to as many people as you can and get their feedback and then listen really, really well. And I'm amazed at how many 
founders don't listen that well and they have you know confirmation bias where they only listen to people who agree to them and people disagree and they discount them well they don't they're not a good customer for me but i think if you learn how to listen really well you can mm-hmm. hone in on exactly what the problem is trying to solve and then if you recruit well that team you build will just keep iterating 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 until you crush that problem Hmm. Well, hey, we'll come into all this later. Um, and I also read, um, you know, you got your engineers to actually sit on the phones to talk to your customer service uh, 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 customers, but we'll come into that later. But let's start off with Kayak in your early days. Travel is really hard. Why did you decide to go down the travel space and what needed to be disrupted into the space back in the early days? Yeah, so tra- Kayak was actually, the original idea came from my co-founder, Steve Hafner, who was one of the founders of Orbitz which is a big online travel agency here in the US. And Steve's observation was 70% of the people in Orbitz would look for, let's say, a flight. And when they found the flight they wanted, they would leave Orbitz and go directly to the airline to book it. And Steve said, that sucks. We pay all this money to get people to come to our site, but they don't pay us any revenue. So what if we created a search engine where there's no way to book a flight? It's just ad-based. When you see the flight or the hotel, the rental car you want, We'll show you five offers and click the one that's the lowest offer, the one that you want. And um, when I met him, he pitched me the idea. I liked the idea. I went out that night. I spent not much time, maybe 15 to 20 minutes on Expedia, which is the market leader in the US at that point. And I just remember thinking, it's not going to be hard to beat them. I found their software to just be incredibly ugly and almost like seizure inducing. There was so much stuff going on on the screen. And I thought, I can build something simpler than this. And usually the startups that end up getting traction and winning aren't the ones with more features. It's the one with more simplicity. So that's what we tried to do at Kayak. More well, simplicity and more speed. More simplicity and more speed. So what was the, why, why the name Kayak? Yeah, so when we incorporated the company, we called it Travel Search Company Inc. Because we had to put a name down on the paper. We didn't know what the name was going to be. Yeah. Steve and I both aspired to create a great brand. We hired a brand agency in New York and worked with them for a couple of months on brand identity. What are your aspirations? What brands do you like? What words did you describe? All that. They came up with a list of 50 or more names. We narrowed it down to five names that we liked. Ike was actually my second choice. Uh-huh. My first choice was Lola, which they uh-huh. the name a name consultant said, that's a good name for travel. You can think of it as standing for longitude, latitude, L-O-L-A. Yeah. Uh, it's funny, years later, after we sold Kayak, I ended up creating a business travel company. At that point, I could afford it. So I bought the name Lola. Yeah. <laughs> and then the funny story about that name, I know this isn't what you asked me, but I sold that company after five or six years to a big bank in the US called Capital One. And they bought us to license our technology for expense management but they didn't buy us for the brand. So I kept the brand. And now I'm running a studio with five or six companies in development. One of the companies I'm building is a dating app and we're calling it Lola. That's and that'll launch in Boston in October. I love that. And what I love about the name Kayak, even if you reverse the name, it's all spelled Kayak. Yeah, it's a palindrome. Right. And Kay, I read a book once by Ogilvy on brand and I, remember reading that K is the most brand most memorable letter in branding that people remember the letter K. So um, I have to tell you one of the most happiest days for me at kayak was we would open browsers in incognito mode. And if you went to Google's homepage, you just type the letter K. The first thing in camp was kayak one day. We were the most searched word, but you letter K and I thought, okay, I think, I think we've made it now. We own a letter. That was, that was very cool. Yeah. Yeah. That is pretty cool. But when people came to your website, were they not really confused? Kayak is in kayaking down. We, we did get hate mail every now and then, yeah. like you bastards taking this name. You know, we're serious kayakers. You shouldn't take this name from us. But my response to that was like, you know, Amazon isn't about a river. Amazon.com. It's a bookstore. And now it's an everything store. Um, and I just like the word kayak. And I think that's okay. You know, someone kayaker wanted the name. They could have bought it before me, but they didn't. Yeah. And I did. I know so, you are a uh, serious domain collector. Did I am. You, did you have to happen? Did you happen to happen to have kayak.com or 
Would you, you no, know? we bought it. We bought it from a company in the UK, actually. Mm-hmm. There's a small consulting company called Kayak. And I believe they sold themselves to IBM in the UK. And somehow we talked them into selling it to us for $30,000, which is, of course, a steal. A single word, five letter domain dot com today would go for several hundred thousand dollars, if not more. Mm. Pretty incredible. But hey, let's talk about the product. Um, what do you think worked so well with the product in the early days? I mean, this is 2004, right? So the internet yeah. is still very early. What what worked so well with the product and how, why, would, why would consumers come to buy from you? A couple of things. One is we really focus on simplicity. I did eye tracking studies. We bought a special computer with two cameras on it. And we'd watch what users were looking at on the screen, where they would click, but where they, what they were looking at. And if there were things on the kayak page that people didn't look at, we just deleted it because we really want as much white space as possible. So we're obsessed with simplicity and speed. <clears throat> the other thing is we convinced them that we had more inventory than anyone else. You know, search with us, book with them was kind of the internal tagline. We'd find every travel database on the planet and put their data into our site. Another thing we became known for is back in 2004, JavaScript was still very, very new. We developed something that, have you ever heard the term Ajax? Yeah. You know what that means? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you go to the Wikipedia page for Ajax, you'll see Kayak is credited as mm-hmm. the first commercial site that did uh, cl- interactive clients in the browser. So we did a flight search and then you said, well, what if I left it at 9 a.m.? Or what if I flew first class? So what if I, you know, change your preferences? would update it immediately in the browser without going back to the server. And um, we had to build all that stuff ourselves because there was no Ajax framework. And we became known for that. Like we had sliders, for example. You could slide exactly what time you would want to fly. We'd narrow down the flights to that time range. I have to admit, we didn't invent it. We kind of stole it from a diamond site called Blue Nile. Oh, really? I, I was on the, I, didn't, I don't know what possessed me to be on a, a diamond site back then, but... Um, I saw they had sliders. I thought that was very, very cool. I remember one of the guys on our board said, it'll never work. You can't invent new UI paradigms. You should use what's tested. But we really like the sliders. And then we were the first site that made them really popular. And then after us, a bunch of sites ended up doing it. Yeah. I think they all did them today, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And how do you get the infantry and the vendors onto the platform? Were you just calling all of the hotels, all the airlines? How do you convince them to come with you? So initially, we actually signed a deal with Orbit, Steve's old company. And we used them as our exclusive backup agency. So we got all the content from them. But once we had the content from them, we knew we would obviously fail if we just had one agency. So we started signing up suppliers direct. And um, some suppliers we put on the site by scraping the website without permission. So there's just people say... Sometimes to do something new, you have to break some laws a little bit. Mm-hmm. So we did not get licenses from all the airlines. We just scraped their sites. I'm told there's at least one airline, which is a pretty big airline that we took down at one point because for every search, there were hundreds of searches. So we ended up exploding the traffic on the website. And then once we got more and more traffic, we'd go back to them and say, okay, we're now doing 10,000 searches a day. Do you want to be on our site integrated into your purchase process? And the more traffic we got, the more deals we got. How were you acquiring your customers? I mean, you mentioned uh, before we came on, you know, you would just go to people in the airports uh, asking what they bought the, the product. But above 100 customers, you know, how do you start having so many customers coming to your to your? So platform? initially, we did it by spending a lot of money in digital advertising and losing a lot of money. I think when we were maybe a year, year and a half old. The first year was just building the product and testing it. And then we started scaling it up a little bit when we were maybe just over a year old. But I remember we were about a year and a half old or so. We were spending about a dollar to buy someone to come to our website. And we were making on average 20 cents. So we're losing like 80 cents a customer, which obviously is not sustainable. Uh, But we did that just to get some more traffic because we keep testing it and refining it. And at one point, and this may have been two and a half years in, we started getting a lot of self-directed traffic, started growing as a greater and greater percentage of traffic. And the reason is people use the site. They said, this is cool. It's simple. It's fast. It's clean. Gives you good prices. And they started telling their friends about it. And remember the time we did our IPO, which uh, if I remember correctly, that was 2012, I believe. 70% of our traffic was self-directed. 
and 30% came through advertising. So we were um, wow. very happy with that, that most of our traffic was self-directed. Yeah. And so the business model, right? So someone would come to your website, how are you generating revenue from the customers? It was split between commission and advertising. Right. Um, and we would we would do deals with suppliers either way, whatever, the, however they wanted to pay. Um, if they wanted to pay per click or per conversion, we'd give them one price per click, another price. If they just want an ad on the right rail, give another price. And we're constantly refining those prices, like tracking our conversion rate, trying to figure out how much money the airlines hotels are making off of us, how much they're paying to be on other platforms. And initially for the first several years, we try to be extreme low cost provider to help us get them on our platform, our traffic grew. And then as our traffic grew, we started increasing prices. Yeah. Hey, I love um, your your hiring principles. I mean, in order to grow a company, right, you you need to have amazing talent. But before that, uh, you need to have a really good co-founder relationship. And yeah. I love the story of how you and Steve met, Steve who co-founded Kayak with you. You were out, you were ha hanging out in one of the VC offices, right? Um, you can tell the story from there. Yeah. So I was um, in EIR at Greylock and I have a friend who was working at another VC firm in Boston called General Catalyst. And he had me come over to look at a company for them. And as I was leaving, one of the partners said, what are you doing here today? I said, I'm looking at a company for your partner, Larry. And he said, there's a guy from Orbitz here named Steve Hafner. He wants to start a travel company. Will you meet with them? I said, sure. So we went downstairs and there's a restaurant in Harvard Square called Legal Seafoods. We had a couple drinks and he pitched me the idea. I liked the idea. And then the funny thing is he said, um, he goes, I'm looking for CTO. I said, I'll find one for you because I run a network of CTOs. Like I run an email list. What are you paying? And he said, a buck 50 and 4%. So I said, I think that sounds great. I, I can find someone for you. He said, why won't you do it? I said, no, I sold my last company. Um, I want to create another company again from scratch. And he said, what would it take to have you do this as my co-founder? And I was feeling quite brash because I just sold <laughs> a company. And I was saying at a minimum 50-50. And I was kind of joking. And he put his hand across the table. And he says, deal, you know, you're in. The, and there like, and wow. After like a 45 minute meeting. Wow. And one thing Steve and I became famous for was he's still at Kayak. Mm. And we're still very good friends. We hang out a lot of time in Miami and New York or Boston. Um, one thing we've been known for is we both are very quick judge of characters. We both also have a high tolerance for risk. And um, we're very impulsive. Some might say reckless. I mean, hopefully not reckless, but we make decisions very, very rapidly. And I think people would say that made the early years at Kai very fun because we're willing to turn on a dime and just try different things. If something wasn't working, we'd try something else. What do you think makes an everlasting relationship with a co-founder so special? I think the main thing is be shockingly honest with each other and be vulnerable with each other. So if you're having a really bad day or something happens out of the office, it's in, interfering with your work or your mood or whatever, to be able to talk to them about it. Not that you want your co-founder to be your therapist, but you want to know about each other. And you don't even have to be best friends, like having beers every night, but you want to feel that you know about each other and you listen to each other. So I think it's, I think being transparent, uh, being a good listener, and then there's just rules of friendship. You know, you want, you want friends, be a good friend. And that's mm -hmm. how you get friends. Mm -hmm. So you want a good co-founder, be a good co-founder. Yeah. I mean, starting a company is hard, right? And uh, especially with early stage startups, maybe co-founders disagree or just it doesn't work out. How did you find disagree? How did you manage disagreeing with each other? Or maybe you didn't. How do I manage the what with each other? How how, how did you manage disagreeing with uh, disagreeing? Steven? Yeah. Yeah. So we kind of had this rule where if we fought about something, whoever felt more strongly would win. And we would learn that there'd be give and take. And you know, if he tried to win every argument, like 10 arguments in a row, that would hurt our relationship. Um, so we just had to give into each other a lot. Each other. And even though I was CTO in charge of product, he had a lot of ideas about product and he'd give me ideas and would fight about them because I'm very opinionated about product. But sometimes he'd feel more stronger than me. I said, I said, I think you're wrong, but let's try it, you know? And we'd put his idea out and see if it worked or it didn't work. 
one of the um principles i'd love for you is always be hiring what should founders think about when looking to hire an amazing candidate or profile i mean the biggest thing is just always be recruiting always be looking to meet interesting people a few years ago i drove for uber and the thing that caused the reason i started driving uber was I wanted to see what it felt like to get rated because I was running a company and we we're going to put in software to let our customers rate our customers for people. And I want to know what that felt like. But then I kept driving. And the reason I kept driving was it was an interesting way to meet people who are very different than me and work in different sectors than me, people I wouldn't normally come encounter with. So I think being a good founder is talking to people and trying to learn something from every person you talk with. And um just enjoying people. When you find someone who has that spark, like they're really bright and they have a fire in them, then find a way to work with them. What's your recruiting style today? You would go the extra mile to hire anyone or? I mean, I I was crazy. I would, I don't want to use the word stalker necessarily, but let's just say if there's someone I wanted to hire, I would be very, very aggressive in finding ways to meet with them um i once tried to hire someone and he said i'm really excited about kayak you seem really great i just can't leave my boss because i like my boss a lot so i called his boss and tried to hire his boss you know and that was not successful but i do find like what are the blockers and then can i remove all those blockers that's pretty small what was the greatest hire you had the great the greatest hire greatest hire that's a tricky one there are so many um there are so many um my longest term collaborator is a guy named paul schwenk we started as programmers together at a company in boston decades ago and then he's been with me on most of my companies at kayak he was svp of engineering and operations so he's both a coder and really good at ops. And he's been a good foil to me because I'm very um, like 10 ideas a day, excited about the shiny new objects. And Paul's a little bit more regimented, a little bit more process oriented. I have very weak process skills. Paul's very strong in process. So that's my longest serving colleague that we just have very complementary skill sets. Yeah. It feels like um, people also resonate with you right um I, i've read a couple of your interviews and it's almost like uh a mini therapist right uh people seem love working with you because they you're very genuine right and it's almost like you're not working for a boss you're working with a colleague who's giving positive feedback when things go wrong not negative feedback why do you think it's so important to be that type of manager versus being a negative manager with maybe negative energy I mean, I when I hire people, we talk about a psychological contract between the founder and the new employee. And I always say, you promised me two things and I promise you two things. The two things you promised me, let's say I'm hiring you as a QA engineer. You have to say, I'll be the best QA engineer in the US. I can be very, very driven to be great. And then they have to promise to be an energy amplifier, which I'll describe in a minute. The two things I promise them is, I say, I promise you'll have more fun working this company than anyplace else. And by fun, I don't mean dancing on tables, although that's encouraged. <laughs> I mean fun in that there's no stress. And if you have an idea, we'll try it. Like that's really exhilarating for bright people. Mm -hmm. And then the second thing I promise people is your skills will accelerate faster at this company than other, any place else you ever worked. I'm really into self-improvement and helping a team improve. I'm really into learning and book groups and listening to podcasts like yours uh, and just like learning journey. The energy amplifier is it's not just the founders. You want everyone in the team. When someone meets with one of my product managers, you want to leave that meeting with more energy than it started. You want to like excite each other. And I try to give feedback to my teams about like how to run good meetings and how to get people excited. You know, when you run a meeting, there's really two goals of every meeting. One is you want to make some decisions quickly, hope there's some good decisions. 
And two, you want to improve the relationships with the people in the room. It sounds crazy to state that as a goal, but if you want your company to scale, like at Kayak, when we went public, we only had 200 employees, but 300 million in revenue. So a million and a half US dollars per employee it was not only higher than anyone ever done in travel, it was higher than Google and higher than Facebook. And the way we did that was we were very good at the way we ran meetings. We we're very impulsive. We tested everything, tried things, and we tuned the team so they really enjoyed each other. Part of that was good recruiting. Part of it, unfortunately, means you fire people that are dysfunctional, but you're just tuning people to how to get the most out of each other and how to really enjoy working with each other. And I just love that assignment. I'm probably five to 10% psychologists in any of my companies. How would people describe you as a manager, do you think? I think they would say energy and creative and gets excited, just gets excited a lot. Yeah. This and if someone comes to you with an idea, I'll yeah. find a way. Sometimes people come with terrible ideas, right? But if they have a terrible idea, I like that they had an idea. Brilliant. And we'll riff on it. And we'll say, I love that you're thinking of a new way of doing this. You know, that, the, here's a couple of challenges with that idea. Let's talk it through. Does that make sense? Does it not make sense? But together, can we come up with an even better idea? Well, sometimes people come to me with a perfectly formed idea. I say, that's amazing. Let's pivot and go do what you just said, because that's a much better idea than mine. I love that listening. And this is quite well connected to the next question where I read um, in the early days, Kayak installed a red telephone in the middle of your office and you would get your engineers to pick up the phone with customers complaining. Why yeah. was that so important? Yeah, so I'm the one who bought that phone and it sat on my desk. And I'm told they removed this after I left Kayak, but... It used to be if you go and went to the main kayak help page, that phone number would just show up maybe 10 or 20% of the time. I dialed it up and down about how often it would show up, but like I wanted to get phone calls during the day. And it probably was only about five to 10 phone calls a day. So I was not on the phone all day. And many of the calls I could do very quickly, but I wanted to hear the pain of a customer because I'll tell you a story. I, saw, I had an e-commerce company in 1999 that I sold to Intuit, the makers of Quicker, Quicken and QuickBooks and TurboTax. And one day we were in a meeting designing sort of the future of electronic invoicing and Scott Cook, the founder was in the meeting. And we're talking about the signup flow and how we thought people would do this to stop using checks and to pay online. This is very early, 1999. And Scott sat there with his arms crossed, was kind of looking at his shoes and shaking his head. And at one point he said, you know, it's interesting what you engineers think, but there's a telephone right there. Why doesn't someone pick up the fucking phone and call an actual customer and ask them what they think? I was like, whoa. And that taught me a lesson to say, you know, let's just make sure we're not in a lab making shit up. Let's make sure we actually talk to people. That's pretty smart. What were people calling about? Was it, I mean, I find travel price comparison websites, right? Super confusing different prices, it's not very clear. And I get frustrated and win the 21st century. What were people calling about back then? It was all over the map. I mean, they'd read online about different, I'd call them mythology about how to get low prices. And so I'd tell them the facts based on the millions of searches we had of like how to get low prices. Um, they would ask, they had to make a flight change. And we would say, well, we didn't even see the purchase because you just, we found you the flight, but you bought it at Delta. So you have to call Delta. We'll give them Delta's phone number. Um, advice about travel and then changes to travel. The most unusual call I got was one time someone called me, not on the red phone, but he called me on my cell phone. There's an older gentleman. And he said, my daughter's trying to visit from North Carolina. He was in Florida. And we... I don't know how to get her a flight that'll come on Thursday. I said, all right, I have you tried using kayak yet? He said, what's kayak? I said, well, I work for a company called kayak. I go, how did you get this phone number? Yeah. He says, on the bulletin board. I said, what bulletin board? He goes, I live at a senior home. And someone said, if you have questions about travel to call this number. Oh, really? Now, it wasn't that unusual that I would give out my cell phone number if I had a good customer. But apparently one day I helped someone in the senior home and they wrote my cell phone number huh. on my mobile number on the building board. This guy called me. I said, okay, well, on your computer, go to kayak.com. He said, I don't own a computer. 
I still talked to this guy for like half an hour because he was he was very interesting to me and um I want to help with this problem. And I won't go into the whole phone call, but it's a very interesting phone call. And many times after I hung up, the people sitting around me were in an open office. And around me, the first five years of Kike, I had no product managers. I'd hired three designers who sat around me that I managed, and then the engineers. And one of the designers said, What was that phone call about? Like that was an unusual sounding phone call. And I would tell the story of that guy many times. And I would say, I want software that is so easy that even this man in his 80s that he could figure it out and use it. So I sort of set the bar, the ease of use bar with this man Mm -hmm. to say, if he had a computer, I want him to understand Kayak. What now, um, you know, it's changed so much, right? This is 2004, 2006, I guess, when the the phone call happened. Um, What still really frustrates you about travel today? Oh, everything. Has it got more complicated since Kayak started? Yeah. So I travel about 100,000 miles a year. I do about one trip a month. Um, I mean, I hate airports. I hate how loud they are. Yeah. Like, it's insane that no one measures the decibel level at an airport. And it's just crazy how chaotic they are. And the services and amenities aren't good. I've been at a couple of really good airports recently this year. I went to Singapore in April. They had a really nice airport. I was in Doha in July because I went to Kenya and I flew Qatar Airlines through Doha. That was a really sweet airport. Most airports are terrible. I don't like that. And then, um, I don't know. I just wish I could do everything with my phone. I hate when I have to pull my credit card out. Uh I just wish I could do everything with the phone. Yeah. And even Kayak, you know, I still use Kayak. I'm so loyal to the company. I left them a while ago now. But the thing that made Kayak was, again, we have this internal tagline, search with us, book with them. We show you everything on the internet and you click and you leave Kayak and go book. Well, I don't actually want to leave Kayak anymore. I want to buy directly from Kayak. I want them to store my credit card because it's a consistent experience. It's fun. It's simple. And I hate going to some random hotel and they have a terrible website and having to learn that and create a password or whatever, different websites. So I want everything from my phone. I like Apple Pay a lot when sites that use that. It's very cool. I want simple sign-on, no passwords, payment via the phone. And someone I I hope someone builds me a quieter airport. (laughs) What about, uh, I was in, uh, where was I? I was in Vienna last week in Austria. And... um... I've been super surprised. Room service is still very analog. Still pick up the phone and order. Why has no one done us an additional version? I think I've been in like 10 hotels now in the last year. There's no digital version for room service. So any founders here today who want to go and build something, maybe there's something there. I think it's a great idea. I have seen at least one company that tried to do it, but they never got traction. And I don't know why. Um... I think that's a great idea. Yeah. I mean, and today maybe like, people just use Uber Eats. I mean, yeah. they might prefer Uber Eats over room service because they have a bigger selection. Yeah, exactly. And what was fascinating, I did some research just for the US. Um, 27% of Americans who stay in US hotels, they spend over $100 on room service. Well, that's a lot. Huge. And if you think you're going to a foreign country, maybe they can't speak English. Um, it's almost like at the checkout and supermarkets, right? So if you digitize this, um, you can probably earn a lot more revenue. And it's just so easy for the hotel. But uh, hey, anyone listening uh, who wants to go and build, maybe uh, I know Paul, your angel investing a bit, maybe Paul's interested. <laughs> yeah, it's a cool idea. I like it. Yeah. But hey, let's talk about, um, you know, running a company is really difficult, right? And people go through difficult personal challenges, mental health, and um if you're open to it, I'd love to just hear about your bipolar story because it is truly inspiring and, um, you know, just lo- love to hear it. And I think it resonates with quite a few founders here today as well. Yeah. So I first got diagnosed as bipolar at age 25. And I struggled a lot in my 20s and 30s with um, extremely big mood changes. When I was manic, I would go several days in a row with zero sleep. I would spend lots of money. 
I would um, drink a lot. Um, it got to the point where my mind was racing so much that I became frustrated talking to people because I thought that people weren't fast enough to keep up with my racing mind. And you end up, dis you end up disconnecting from people. On the depressive side, I would be on the floor of my bedroom for days. I couldn't even get on the bed, just laying on the floor, panic attacks, like really bad. And over time, through medication and therapy, I learned to mostly stabilize. And then the thing that's gotten better for me in the last 10 years is I've been studying Buddhism. <clears throat> and it's not that I think Buddhism is the answer to all life's problems, but it's helped me tremendously. Um, it helped me a lot with stress and anger. Buddhism, some people say it's a study that in Buddhism, we believe that suffering is universal. And through the study of Buddhism, you learn to alleviate suffering of yourself and of others. And one of the things we learn is that when you're suffering, it's really just a non-acceptance that the world is one way, you want it to be another, and you suffer. You get angry, you get scared, you get frustrated because something isn't the way you want it. And so I'm a big fan of the serenity prayer, which see if I remember this, may God give me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. And I really have come to live with that. And if someone wrongs me or hurts me, it sounds crazy, but I accept it. I try to not let them hurt me again, but I don't lose sleep over it. Hmm. And I've come to believe that the person who hurt me, if I had their biology and their upbringing in the day they had, I'd do the same bad action that they did. So I just accept everyone. Again, I don't put myself in a position to be hurt again, but I learned that through complete acceptance, there's no stress. And right now, I'm running a startup studio. I'm launching four companies in the next three months. I get about 300 real emails a day. Um, plus I'm running four nonprofits that I've started in the last 10 years. I serve on eight nonprofit boards. I frequently guest lecture at different universities, but I sleep eight to nine hours a night and I live a life with very little stress. And to me, the serenity prayer and radical acceptance has caused me to, has taught me how to live a life with no stress. And there's an anger thing in there too, that I used to be oppressed with a lot of anger. And there's a Vietnamese Buddhist named Thich Nhat Hanh who passed away recently, but he has a book on anger that really opened my eyes. And I got to attend a lecture that he gave in Boston once in 2002. And that changed me quite a bit and learned me to get, taught me how to get rid of anger. It's funny, my girlfriend gets frustrated that someone will wrong me and she'll get really angry at them, but I don't get angry at all. And then she gets frustrated, like, why aren't you angry at them? They just did this terrible thing to you. But um, I, there's a saying in Buddhism that being angry at someone else is like drinking poison and expecting them to die. Mm. I look at anger as building what I call soul tumors. So why would you want to build a tumor in your body just because someone did something wrong you shouldn't bring violence upon yourself and when you're angry you're bringing violence upon yourself super fascinating um entrepreneurs go through a lot of stress rise maybe because they're doing this for the first time or maybe things aren't going according to plan if you could provide one lesson to them um to sleep more live a, pro a prolific life without any stress i think you said that in one of your interviews what, what advice would you give them? They say you're the average of the five people you spend the most amount of time with. So be selective. You know, every company needs a mission statement. I think every human should have a mission statement as well. You should have your journey. Like, where do you want to be in 10 years? What do you want in your gravestone? Um, the artist Banksy, I believe it was him who said, we all will have two deaths. The day we take our last breath and the last day someone mentions our name. So you think about that, you think about your legacy and your mission statement. And then you think about the people you spend time with and how you spend your time. And you think, am I on the right journey? So to lead 
a company that's enjoyable, hire people that are really fun, like hire people with a sense of humor, hire people that are kind and vulnerable and confident and silly, you know, like surround yourself with people you're going to have a good time hanging out with. Many of us spend more time at work than we get to spend with our own kids mm -hmm. at a certain age. And on the one hand, that sounds, just sounds terrible. Mm -hmm. By the other hand, it's kind of the way the economy works. You're at a desk for at least eight hours a day. And so if you're going to be at a desk eight hours a day or wherever you are for your job, try to do it with people that are really fun, that you can enjoy and laugh during the day. Well, hey, it kind of all paid off, right? Um, if we fast forward to 2012, Kayak is about to go public. Is the day of going public. What's going through your mind? I mean, preparing for the roadshow took two months, maybe three months. The roadshow took a week. And then we were public. And during the preparing for the roadshow, but then while we're on the roadshow where you're being priced, you're trying to pre-sell stock and you see how much orders you get during the day as you leave each presentation, you do 10 presentations a day for seven to 10 days and the orders are coming in during the during the roadshow. You're getting a sense of your value and what you're gonna go public at. And I used to always do the math of how much money my assistant was gonna make. And it sounds crazy, but I didn't really do the math how much money I was gonna make. I made a lot of money at Kayak but I really wanted my assistant to make enough money, you know? So she bought a house and my engineers did really well. And I love that. And I think we had 200 employees, over half of them became millionaires the day we went public. And then many more became millionaires as we sold the company a year later. And then we sold it to a company which did really well. And this stock kept growing and growing. And I liked that of making people at the company, not only trying to build the best place they ever worked, the most fun they ever worked, better skill acceleration, it's nice to also make money for people. And that was a lot of fun. That's really nice. Why Why did the um, Priceline board the company right a year later uh, for a couple of billion dollars? Why, why, did, why, why did they buy it so quickly after as soon you went public? They tried to buy us before we went public. There's about six companies that tried to buy us, like serious, serious effort to try to buy us. Um, and in every case I had sold my last company. I didn't want to sell again. I wanted to, I wanted to go public one day cause I'd never done it. I wanted to experience it. So we turned down every offer Priceline are really booking holdings. Booking.com is really the, the force behind Priceline. Um, they were a monster company and a good company, a very well run company. And they tried to buy us for the IPO and they made us a great, great offer. But at the end of the day, my co-founder's like, we talked about going public, but this amazing offer, what should we do? I said, I've never gone public. I really just want to try it. And maybe this will be a mistake and we were not going to go public with the value as we thought, but let's try because something new. We've always said we like experiencing new things. So we went public. And right after we went public, we began negotiations again to have them acquire mm -hmm. us. And we went public, I think at 1.2 billion. We negotiated a deal at 1.8 billion. By the time it closed, it was over 2 billion. So it was a good markup from the IPO. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Hey, we have a lot of questions coming in. Um, but before we jump to questions, I thought it'd be do it'd be good to do some fun facts, which I've been told about you and that and from what I've seen. Um so why don't we begin with the first one? I mentioned earlier you're a big domain collector. What's your portfolio of domains worth nowadays? And what's your, what what was the best one? It's hard to come up with a total value because you don't know the value until you start negotiating to sell them. I own about 500 domain names. Um, I own a lot. Like one that I like is qshop.com, just let a Q, S-H-O-P. That'd be a great name for an e-commerce company. I had a product called QShop many years ago and I ended up buying the domain back from the company that I sold to. Um, I don't know. I, some of them are really goofy domains. Like, I own a domain centralauthority.com, which I thought would be really funny. The idea for that is a humor website where you go to centralauthority.com. You type in some random fact. We generate a page for you, centralauthority.com slash 13582, and it just states your fact. 
And then you can tell people your fact and say, I read this on centralauthority.com. This is an internet. This is true. It was huh. just a joke, right? But yeah. I have some of my domains are just for fun jokes. And some of them are serious companies that I have ideas for. I have a Google document for each company or for ones that are intended to be companies. I probably have at least a hundred Google documents huh. that document ideas for hundred companies, at least a hundred. What was the latest one? What was the latest idea? Um, I had an idea this week of a company that I, I came with the idea of beast mode. That's not a perfect name, but, and I do not own that domain name. I don't own it yet. <laughs> um, Probably uh, not by tonight to be gone. Yeah. But the idea, well, someone owns it. I oh. looked into it. So I'd have to negotiate with them to buy it. And it's not actually the perfect name, but the idea for the company is you go to beast mode and you ask any question. So you say, um, a woman might say, I'm pregnant and my baby is doing six months. Like what vitamin should I take? And so what we would do is we'd create a page, beastmode.com slash what vitamin should I take? And in there on one half of the page, we would show what chat GPD answer is. On the other half of the page, we let humans answer it. And then we let the community vote which answer they like better a human answer or the chat GPT answer mm. and anyone who can beat chat BT, we call them beast mode. It's I like, who's, smart, who's smarter than AI. Yeah. So uh, that was, idea, that was an idea I had this week. That was a cool idea. Another cool idea was, um, when two founders or three founders came along and, uh, started to try and convince people to rent out their rooms. This is Brian Chesky and, uh, the Airbnb co-founders. I think you had the opportunity to invest or you met them at like a billion dollar valuation, right? I met Brian right when he was financing the billion dollar valuation. And he wanted to meet me because Kayak was a much bigger company than them at that point. Um, and he sort of pitched me in Airbnb. I remember at the time saying, I like your UI. And I think what you're doing is super fucking clever. I'm not sure if mass market will ever go for this. You know, someone in your living room but it's clever. And I passed on the opportunity to invest because I thought like a billion seemed like a lot, but I've been, I mean, overall my IRR is 30.5% in the last five years. So I'm doing pretty well, much better than the stock market. Yeah. I've invested in 60 startups. So I've had some good hits like 40 X, 22 X, 11 X, 10 X, 9 X. So I've had some good hits, but I've also made a lot of misses. Airbnb was a big miss. Um, Snapchat, it did $80 million valuation, a big miss. Slack was a big mess. I get a lot of deals in front of me and I've missed a lot of good deals, but more, I do like investing and meeting entrepreneurs, but even more than that, I like running a startup studio where we get to work on our own ideas. That's cool. I think uh, you are in pilots.com, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's a 40X right now. Yeah, they're, they're cool team, cool founders. Um, and another cool interaction, I think you had Michael Moritz of Sequoia Capital. Yeah. He introduced you to the YouTube founders, right? Or something. Yeah. To Chad. Yeah. We were in Michael's office at the same time because <clears throat> the time Michael invested in Kayak was the same time he's invested in the YouTube, YouTube guys. He goes, guys, I want you to meet each other. And we were both working out of the Sequoia office. And he's like, Paul's doing a travel search engine and Chad is doing a uh, a video hosting site. And I'm like, yeah, like that's going to be real. Like I'm thinking there's a lot of video hosting sites back then. Why is he thinking he's going to be different? So I missed that one by a million miles. A million. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I heard you're quite the musician. I wouldn't say quite the musician. I used to be a very serious musician in high school and college. I studied music. I wrote for 15 piece jazz band. I played three or four instruments. Um, I've been, I've studied digital music recently at Berkeley college of music. I've lectured there. I'm I'm not being modest when I say this. I'm not a good musician. I just love music. Well, if you ever decide to write an album, let me know. I'll be your first. Okay. Uh, I'll be your first buyer. Um, but a couple of the questions here from the founders. Uh, Kayak, such an amazing story. What was the hardest day you can remember, which you'll never forget? Um, it's a day that I unfortunately had many times at Kive, which is the day I had to fire someone. It's the worst thing of a manager because when you fire someone, I always look at it as my failure 
that I couldn't figure out during the recruiting process that this person wouldn't have worked out. And many people I fired, they're good people and they have skills just for whatever reason. They didn't fit what my needs were at the time. And the team I put them on, they didn't work well with that team. Those were always the worst days for me as the days we had to fire people. It's always really difficult when you have to let someone go. How do you, and found founders here today, you gonna, are going to have that at some stage. Um, what's, the what's the entry point into that conversation to having to let someone go? The main thing is you want to be honest with them and direct. Once you tell someone they're fired, they sort of don't hear anything else you say. So you don't want a long conversation. So typically what I'll say is I'll call you into an office. I might have someone else sitting in the office just to have someone else witness. I'll say, Ollie, I have some bad news for you. Today's your last day at Kayak. I have a folder of information here with information about your severance plan and your health benefits. The decision is non-negotiable. Um, you can either just sort of sneak out now and come back later to get your stuff or uh, whatever. Mm -hmm. I wrote my cell phone number on the folder. You can call me. I can get together with you this weekend at a Starbucks near you, wherever you want. And we can go into what happened, what could have been diff done different. But at this point, I just want to let you know, today's your last day. It's not negotiable. Wow. Well, that's pretty amazing. You put your number on in the docs. Yeah. So they can get hold of you. And do you, do you go the extra mile to try and find them another job? Or And there's a little bit. Absolutely. Words. Absolutely. There's one guy right now who I had to fire recently. And I told him I have a lot of connections on LinkedIn. So make sure you're connected with me. And any job you opening you find, see who I know at that company and I'll write your recommendation letter. And it's someone that didn't work out for my company, the stage route at one of my companies, but he's a good person and he has skills. I've literally sent probably, trying to think, being like at least 25 letters for him so far. Wow. And the thing I learned is it's terrible when you have to fire someone, but if you fire someone, treat them well, and you'll get positive payback if you treat people well. If you're known as a fair player and you're kind to people, you'll reap benefits from that. You have so many ideas. I want, there are a couple of questions here around uh, motivation. You don't need to work. Why do you continue to do cool stuff? I love inventing and I love hanging out with people who like to ideate. I love coming up with a new idea. I love designing software. I'm obsessed with the brand and the visual design and the simplicity and the speed. And I get to do that over and over and over again. So I just enjoy doing it. You have so many uh, companies currently going on. And uh, before we finish, why don't we hear kind of what's keeping you busy nowadays and What's the one company you still haven't started, which you think, yeah, that's that's another kayak? The one I'm working on now? Yeah. So I am running a new travel company. It's called Deets, like show me the Deets, deets.com. So a good domain name. Um, mm -hmm. We have a city guide out now, which is a city guide to restaurants, and it's a mobile app. We're relaunching it in October. It'll be a very different company in October. It's going to be a full-on consumer travel company. It will be using AI as part of its new life. And you'll have to check us out in October. It'll be deets.com. That's one I'm putting a lot of energy into. And then the dating app I mentioned earlier, Lola, there's a wait list right now at lola.com, another good domain name. All my companies have good domain names. Um, and we're doing something which is very different than any of the dating app out there. And um, Unfortunately, I can't talk too much about that one either. That one also is launching in October. I have four companies launching in the next three months. Exciting times. Well, we can't wait to hear more. We can't thank you enough. Thank you so much. This has been such an incredible hour. I think we could have done another hour, but um, uh, all things, all good things come to an end. But thank you so much. This has been so awesome. And um, we can't wait to see all your companies come to life. And we have great people for you to hire as well. So uh, we'll put in some good recommendations to you. All right. Thanks a lot, Ollie. It's been great talking with you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ollie, and we'll catch up again soon. Okay. Bye, Ollie.